please turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1 as we continue our teaching series, Future Church. Up on the docket for today is a community of contribution and a culture of careerism. And stand with me for the reading of Scripture. We stand to, in the language of the New Testament, honor God with our body. And to honor what we are about to read is not just an ancient, subversive, anti-myth, but as Scripture. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Turn the page. Chapter 2, verse 8. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, a Hebrew word meaning delight. And there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good, as opposed to the not good gold, which I'm happy to take off your hands for you. Um, <laughs> Aromatic resin and onks are also there. The name of the second river is the Gishon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Take a seat. Let's start off with a little David Foster Wallace. In his famous commencement speech at Kenyon College, he said this, in the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. We've said a lot over the last few months about secularism in America and its rapid acceleration over the last year and how religion has not gone away. You could argue that America is more religious than ever. In fact, you could argue that we are living through a generation-wide religious revival, but that the religion has moved over into the realm of politics which is exactly what Leslie Newbegin said would happen back in the 70s. He warned of the rise of what he called the political religions. But there is another pseudo-religion that's not been in the spotlight as much over the last year due to all things COVID and the election cycle, but is just as much a form of idolatry that is vying for your heart and mind's allegiance to over against our allegiance to that of Jesus. And that is the religion of work. Derek Thompson, a staff writer for The Atlantic, calls it workism. In his article, Workism is Making Americans Miserable, he writes this, Workism is among the most potent of the new religions competing for congregants. What is workism? It is the belief that work is not only necessary to economic production, but also the centerpiece of one's identity and life's purpose. The best educated and highest earning Americans who can have whatever they want have chosen the office for the same reason that devout Christians attend church on Sundays. It is where they feel most themselves. But our desks were never meant to be our altars. 
Think of the image of a WeWork or Google office complex with a cafe and a gym and a daycare center and school and community events and even nap pods, right? Which is kind of cool, but it's actually designed and engineered to make your job your life to make it your identity, tell me about yourself, I am filling your career, your community of belonging, and even your purpose in life. Work has evolved, especially for educated millennials and soon for Gen Z, from a means of material production to a means of identity production. This is a part of a larger cultural shift across the West from an honor culture to what the Korean-German philosopher Byung-Chul Han calls an achievement society, In an honor culture, you accrue social capital by serving well in your role in the community as a father or a mother or a son or a daughter or a craftsperson or merchant or an authority figure or a guardian of faith or tradition. But now we accrue social capital through education, wealth, status, career, fame, all of which deracinate social cohesion in the name of radical individualism. Put another way, value is no longer given based on who one is, but on what one does. And Han, in his excellent book, The Burnout Society, writes about how the result of an achievement culture is a generation-wide epidemic of burnout, chronic anxiety, and doping. In 2019, the World Health Organization finally included burnout in its international classification of diseases, and it's getting worse, not better, in spite of all the chat about wellness and all the apps that we have now for headspace and meditation. In one wide-ranging study on the rise of burnout through COVID, 89% of respondents said their work life was getting worse, 62% of people had experienced burnout often or extremely often in the previous three months, Only 21% rated their well-being as good, and a mere 2% rated it as excellent. 2%. Translation, while work is a very good and important part of our life and our humanity, more on that in a minute, but especially for educated urbanites, it has turned into far more into a religion into an altar on which people sacrifice their soul, their marriage, their family, their integrity, their spirit. And it is a bad religion. Over against a culture of workism is the biblical vision of work, not as careerism, but as contribution. Let me sketch out a biblical theology of work in just a few minutes because there's literally a clock right in front of me and it is ticking, right? Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, humanity is created to rule. The Hebrew word there is radah. One Hebrew scholar defined it as to actively partner with God in taking the world forward. You thought you were just going to work in the morning or getting your kids out of bed. No, you are actively partnering with God in taking the world forward. It can be translated rule or reign, or in the King James, it's have dominion. It is the language of royalty. It's what kings do and what queens do. In fact, in the ancient Near East, the phrase, the image of God, and there's a Jamaican scholar who's, who's like done the seminal work on this, it was used for the king. The king was thought of as quasi-divine, as a priest-like mediator between God or the gods or the goddesses and Egypt and Assyria or Babylon. That meant, follow the implications of the worldview, that everybody else was not the image of God, which in turn meant that everybody else was essentially slave labor to do Pharaoh and his rich friends bidding. Set over against the ancient Near Eastern culture, the Genesis story is subversive on multiple levels, and in particular to the abuse of power. Not to power itself, but to the abuse of it. It says no We are all made in the image of God. Not just kings, not just men, not just one ethnic group in power. All, this was literally an unheard of idea. This is the the seedbed, that line that we just read, of all of the Western ecosystem of human rights. Not just men, not just one people group or ethnic group. All people are made in the image of God and made to rule over the earth on God's behalf, gathering up the creation's praise, so to speak, and somehow giving it back to the creator. 
And ruling is a lot like what we call work, Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, no surprise, we read about the raw materials in the Garden of Eden. Did you catch that paragraph and wonder why is that line there about gold and aromatic resin? What does that have to do with my morning contemplative prayer routine or whatever? And human is put there in the garden to, quote, work it and take care of it. Now, a word on each. First, human is to, quote, work it. The Hebrew word there is abad, and it can be translated cultivate, or develop, or draw out its potential. Listen to Tim Keller's definition of work based on biblical theology. Quote, rearranging the raw materials of a particular domain to draw out its potential for the flourishing of everyone. Rearranging raw materials in order to create a Eden-like space for human beings to flourish in relationship to God, to each other, to our own self, and to the earth itself. Now, this is true of all sorts of work. When a farmer, most obvious example, takes soil and seed and rearranges it into a crop with food for people to eat and enjoy and live. Or when those of you working at a restaurant take that crop and other crops and rearrange them into a meal for us to share in community in a freezing cold tent outside with a bad heater. Or when an entrepreneur takes an idea or a craftsperson takes a lump of metal or clay or a parent takes a child. All of this is the work of cultivation. In fact, our word culture comes straight from this idea of cultivation. Good culture is the result of good people who take the raw stuff of planet Earth and make it into an Eden-like place of delight. So first, work it. Secondly, we are to, quote, take care of it. In Hebrew, it's one word, shamar. Can you say that? Yeah, Yeah, you have that one in you. You even said the sh, right, good job. And it can be translated guard, or watch over, or protect. Our generation is more aware than any in a very long time, I'm thinking right now of the wildfires in September, of the need to shamar the earth, to guard it, to watch over it, to steward it as a precious resource that does not belong to us, it does not even belong to our grandchildren. In the language of scripture, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And we steward it on his behalf and to him, not just to the next generation. This means we're not just called to any kind of work, to make money and pay the bills, but we are called to garden-like work. Our call in biblical theology is to continue what Adam and Eve started. It's key to realize that the garden was a project, not a product, meaning it was designed to go somewhere, Scholars argue God's original intention pre-fall was for Adam and Eve to spread the boundaries of the garden out over the whole earth. That's why when you get to the end of the Bible, to the Revelation, the last two chapters are all about the future, and they are dripping with illusion after illusion and quote after quote of Genesis 1 and 2 and 3. But in Revelation, it's not a garden anymore, it's a garden-like city, which is a little weird. You think if Jesus' agenda is to heal and put everything back together, the story would end kind of with all of us back in the garden, and we all live on Maui, and we're all naked, but somehow it's not weird, and it's beautiful, right? But instead, that's not the future. It's similar, but it's different. It's not a garden, it's a garden-like city with walls and gates and streets and dwellings and infrastructure and society and culture and food and drink and art and music and poetry. Why? Because the garden was never supposed to stay a garden. It was always supposed to become a garden-like city. Somebody should write a book about this. (laughs) Now, been there. Is there a practice from the way of Jesus and from our rule of life at Bridgetown Church to participate in this vision of work, not as careerism, but as contribution, and to shift our heart in that direction? Yes, it is the practice of vocation. Now, we often don't think of vocation as a practice, which is tragic because we spend something like two-thirds of our life working, again, whether it's paid work or not, and if we cut that off from our spiritual life, we essentially cut Jesus out of the majority of our life. And in the church, we often spend the majority of our time talking about the minority of our day-to-day life. 
And like a practice, it is on a schedule. Like I'm guessing you have a time when you show up for Zoom tomorrow morning or show up for class or wake your children up or show up to volunteer, whatever your work is, again, paid or unpaid. The word vocation itself comes from the Latin vocatio and it just means calling. Now there are three or so layers to calling or vocation in biblical theology. Just give me a minute here. First layer, we are called to follow Jesus. This is the main word if you just Google search or do a word study on calling in the New Testament. It's the main way it's used. Our first and primary call is just to Jesus not to a job or a career. And this means whether you have the privilege and the agency to dream about what career is a good fit for you or whether like most Christians around the world, you are living somewhat hand to mouth, you have a calling from God. You have a destiny in God's great universe and one day you will co-rule with Jesus over all of the universe. And if you think that sounds crazy, read the last two chapters of the Bible. Secondly, we are called to do our work as an act of discipleship to Jesus. We often don't think of work as an act of discipleship. So maybe you get up at six and you have a half hour or an hour set aside for scripture and prayer. You think of that as discipleship, but then you have to be at work at eight and you don't think of that as discipleship as well. But think about it. Jesus was a carpenter for decades. If he came today, he could very well have been a carpenter or a tradesman or a construction worker or a software engineer or a barista or an artist or a small business owner, meaning he could very well do what you do. We must come to view our work, whether it is our job or our work as a stay-at-home parent or a caregiver or volunteer, whether it is glamorous or mundane, whether it's our dream or just a way to pay the bills. We must view it as a key facet of our apprenticeship to Jesus, as the place that we, most of us, spend the bulk of our time. And I would argue, in particular for those of you who are single, as the primary context in our spiritual formation. The place that we work out with God and community in prayer, our spiritual life, the daily invitations we receive to grow and mature, to face our shadow, to come face to face with our sin, our fear, our attachments, all of the stuff of the spiritual life. Third layer is we are called to play our role in the family of God and the flourishing of humanity. We beat up a lot around here on Western individualism, but honestly, you could argue that individualism comes out of Christian theology. Unmoored from God and church and family, it's turned toxic in the West, but the idea that you are, in the language of Psalm 139, fearfully and wonderfully made, and that the days ordained for you were written in God's book before one of them came to be, meaning that you have a person that God made you to be and a calling, something that God has made you to do, that idea comes right out of Christian and biblical theology. In Christian theology, your calling isn't something you choose, like your career or where you go to college or if you go to college or what city you land in. It's much deeper than that. It's something that you discover, that you unearth and excavate from your inner man and woman, and often that you and I have to surrender to and let go of control to God for. Culture says, I am what I do. Scripture says, I do what I am. Those of you in the room, myself included, with privilege, get to dream about finding a source of income that is in line with our call from God, And then in Christian theology, that comes with the onus of responsibility to do the hard work of justice, to extend that opportunity to as many as possible. Much could be said about that. Not all of us achieve that. Most Christians around the world don't even get the chance to try, and that's okay. They still, you still have a vocation, a calling from God. Those of us who do, it often takes decades to get a job that is the right fit, and no matter how great your job is, all work is full of toil, mundanity, and disappointment. Even at its best, work is not God and the ground is cursed. But still, we have a calling from God, a unique contribution 
built into your genetic code with the way that God wired you, no matter what your origin was with your parents. Thinking about some of you that are very aware that you were not wanted by your parents. You were to your parents an accident or a mistake. But there are no accidents, there are no mistakes in God's great universe. You were born with a destiny. You were not just the product of random chemical reactions between two drunken lovers. You were the soul designed and built and dreamed up by God himself with a destiny in his great universe. And whatever you were born into or not born into, you have a calling from God, a person that God made you to be, and a unique contribution that God made you to do. Now, how do we repurse? Pers- I'm sorry, excuse me. Hmm. Evan, can we just uh, cut and edit that part out? And how do we, re- sorry, that was old COVID time. Sorry, pre live stream. It was amazing, by the way. There was a reason there for like multiple months I didn't say anything wrong. <laughs> you don't even know who Evan is. He is all of our hero over the last year. Now, how do we repurpose our work? Paid or unpaid, glamorous or mundane, our dream job or underemployment in COVID, how do we repurpose it into a practice or a spiritual discipline of calling or vocation? Really, we're asking, how do we do the same thing as most of our coworkers or other parents or whatever, but as a vocation? Well, to start, our work as followers of Jesus should have three basic qualities. It should be motivated by love, guided by scripture, and done with excellence. A short word on each to end. First, motivated by love. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians about, quote, labor prompted by love or motivated, it can be translated, or driven by agape. Not by ambition or greed or status seeking or performative identity or power or grasping for control or a search for self-worth or validation or accolades to prop up your fragile ego. We may do the same thing as the person one cubicle over, but for a very different reason, motivated by love. Second, guided by scripture. Some philosophers define work as adding value to the world. Willard called it the expending of energy to produce good. Either definition, value or good, this means that all work is moral. And not all work is blessable by God. We do all we can to find work that is blessable by God. Again, there's privilege here. Not all of us even have that much of a choice, but we do all we can, all that is in our power to find work that is blessable by God, garden city kind of work. But it doesn't have to be glamorous. Don't misread me into saying you need to become a film director making you know, documentaries about injustice or whatever. That would be really cool. But it can be changing tires at Les Schwab or bussing tables or pulling weeds. In fact, historians of religion argue that Christianity was not only the first religion but the first worldview to ever dignify manual labor as something worthy of respect. Not as in the ancient world as it was thought, work for slaves and fit for slaves alone that was beneath the dignity of the ruling class. No, but as good and honest with God's blessing over it. Adam was a gardener. Jesus was, we say carpenter. Do you know that's actually a really lousy translation? The Greek word is tekton, and it just means like builder or worker. There's no wood. I've been to Nazareth. Have you ever been there? There's like one tree in the whole area, and it's like, it's not even Eastern Oregon tree. It's like 10 feet tall at best, right? If that, it's more likely that he was what we would call a mason, a stone worker. He was most likely strong and burly and would do the hard work of masonry day in, day out to build cities and homes for people to live in. This was good and honest work. Jesus did it for decades of his life. Third, our work must be done to the best of our ability. Not to the best, not in a competitive sense, that's just more of the ego, that's careerism, but to the best of our ability. There's that line in Colossians, whatever you do, I love that, whatever you do, that's pretty all-encompassing for whatever you give your life to right now. 
Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. That's crazy. We are to work as if Jesus was our boss, right? Not the corporation, not the small business or restaurant, not our three children. You are not our boss, no. It does feel that way a lot of the time, right, moms and dads? But we are to work as if Jesus was our boss. Dorothy Sayers, many years ago, said the best way to serve Jesus at work is to, quote, serve the work. What she meant by that was just to be really good at whatever it is you do. In her classic irreverent tone, she said, the church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him to not be drunk and disorderly in his leisure hours and to come to church on Sundays. What the church should be telling him is this, that the very first demand that his religion makes upon him is that he should make good tables. Come on. There's a Hebrew concept called kavana that Alan Hirsch writes about in The Shaping of Things to Come, and it basically translates into the power of holy intent. Some rabbis teach that when the fall happened, the manifest glory of God was shattered into tiny imperceptible pieces. But when we do our work with kavana, with the power of holy intent, meaning when we bring our full presence to a day or to a task, when we are motivated by love, not ego, but we are there to love and serve and make our unique contribution, and when we are guided by scripture, and when we do all with excellence to the best of our ability, that we are reweaving the manifest glory of God into the created order. One rabbi tells a story about a cobbler who used to weave shoes together. This is long before Nike, okay? Very old analogy. Think leather shoes, when shoes were made by hand. And he tied the the top of the shoe to the bottom of the shoe. And as he was weaving it together, he said, I'm reweaving glory. This is the barista at your local coffee shop, now behind plexiglass, but not for long, who um, doesn't just hand you your latte with the lid on screwy and say, okay, have a good day, but does the heart, you know what I'm talking about? (laughs) Skills, you have skills, and then puts the lid on where the sippy part is not over the seam. You know what I mean? First world problems, but this is no good when they do that, and then you like take a sip and it leaks all over your t-shirt. I mean, this is, this is suffering, all right? (laughs) Portland style. And then, and then even turns it to just with the logo facing you and then makes eye contact with you and just with a smile says something to bless. Just have a great day or enjoy your flat white or whatever it is. Like that's kavana. That's the power of holy intent. That's a form of love. This is the construction worker who doesn't just throw a bathroom remodel together as cheap as possible and ignore the stuff he found behind the wall, but does every step with the skill and attention to detail and passion of an artist. It's the preschool teacher who doesn't just babysit children and throw fishy crackers at them, but is down eye level to communicate, if without words, you are fearfully and wonderfully made and you have a destiny in God's great universe. It's the parent who doesn't just hand them a device and go try to survive the day, but is there to unfold children into their full potential. And you thought you were just making breakfast or spell-checking your email a second time or setting a table. Actually, you are reweaving glory. Any task, no matter how mundane, no matter how unglamorous, can become not just a form of contemplative prayer. It can become a form of kavana with the power of holy intent. Over the last month and a half now, we have been dreaming together about a future church of orthodoxy to the way of Jesus, no matter the cost and the hostility of the culture, of holiness where we are set apart for and dedicated to God, not just in our sexuality, but in our whole body. God, here we are in love to receive all that you are. Men and women of peace who live from a deep calm and serenity in a culture that is swirling in anxiety and rage. Men and women who are peacemakers in a time of political polarization where everybody is angry at everybody 
else. And now we're dreaming about a Portland and a Bridgetown where we and other followers of Jesus across the city, where we make our contribution to the city's human flourishing. We do what we can for the healing in particular of our city over the last year, which we literally see just walking down the sidewalk right now, to be a part of the healing of our city and the renewal of our city, to play our small little part to index Portland a little bit more toward Eden a little bit more toward Revelation 22, a little bit more toward the new Portland and the new Jerusalem, because as it says in Hebrews, we are looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. This is my last teaching in the series. Dave Lomas is coming next week from Reality SF. Tyler is coming after that to end the series. I know that I have said a lot of hard things over the last month or two. And you have been amazing. Like your, your open heart, your yes to Jesus' call has been stunning. And part of the reason was just before my run as your lead pastor is up, I wanted to make just a few last deposits because I love you so much. And I care so much about you and our future together. At 40 years old now, I think I have the self-awareness to see how much of the first half of my life was motivated not by love, but by ego, and was guided not by scripture, but by the world. In my job, you know, it's incredibly easy to do all of the right things for all of the wrong reasons, and to justify ambition, power, workaholism, status, as, quote, serving God rather than call a spade a spade. Eight years ago this month, um, those of you that were around back then, I resigned from leading a family of churches that we were part of and a much larger church out in the suburbs to go on sabbatical and then come back to Bridgetown and just give myself more fully to you and to a slower, simpler life. The transition that I'm about to step into, I see as just the next step on that same trajectory in my life and the next step in your life and our life together. I like to call my career path downward mobility, you know what I mean? Mega church pastor to urban church pastor to starting nonprofit that will be me. And if we're lucky, Deanna, wherever you are, the two of us rock and roll together, right? But now I just feel like the foundation is set for our church and it is Jesus the Messiah. And now we get to build. It's no secret to me that we're literally in this building. The room that you're in right now, we're working right now with designers and architects to plan this into a justice center when live stream is done. Like we get to build for the next season. And I feel more free now at this point in my life than I ever have of the idol, which is really a cruel tyrant of ambition and careerism. And feel more free than ever to just wake up in the morning and play my small part in our church, in our city, and I know that you are in that same spot. None of us are there. All of us are on the journey. It's not about arrival. It's about the process. But we are all called of God to make our unique contribution. In closing, our practice for the week ahead is all up at bridgetown.church slash future. There's a few ideas for there. You could start with just repurposing a few kind of tasks in the week ahead with Kavana. There's more as well as a community guide for you to process the transition. To end, Kahil Gabran, the Lebanese artist, once said, work is love made visible. In the end, work, like all of life, is about becoming people of love. Working to earn love through accomplishment and accumulation is a bad religion. Working to express the love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit flowing from inside the deepest recess of your being as an act of worship to God and of love for neighbor done with kavana, with holy intent, with love, with scripture, with excellence, that is religion at its best. <laughs>